Praise God. Thank God. God with whom your entire being seeks connection. For when you are truly connected, it's as if you have finally quenched your thirst after a trek across Death Valley on a summer's day. Join with God now in this time of sacred sanctuary and find welcome and love. Know that God offers something that is better more satisfying than a dinner at Olive Garden, followed by Ben and Jerry's. Let your joy sing forth, because you have found God right here, right now. Let us pray. God, who are we who gather this day for worship and song? Who are we who come each week to seek your presence? We are your people, O Holy One, our God of might and truth, creator and redeemer, God who tenderly reaches out to us with solace in our times of grief and fear, our God who lifts us up when we have fallen, our God who gives us that much needed kick when we have found ourselves paralyzed by feelings of ineptitude or inadequacy. You, Ancient of Days, giver of the Son of the Most High and the Advocate who breathes into us with each breath we take, who walks with us each step we take. You, O Benevolent and Understanding One, meet us on this day and in each of our separate spaces, making them holy by your presence and your promise. For all this, we give you our gratitude in you we place our hope. Amen. And now I'm going to share our my screen so that we can sing our children's welcoming song and welcome our kids forward for children's moment. Good morning, all you big children and small children and medium-sized children. It's a fabulous morning at my house because it's snowing so beautifully and so lightly, and I love it. I'm feeling really good. The hummingbirds say they're mad because they have no food, so I better do that later. I'm getting distracted as usual. I was watching a video the other day with some of my students, and this science guy was talking about being so scared when he was little 
about bugs, about insects. He was just terrified. He didn't want to go outside. People couldn't talk to him about him. He couldn't see him in books. And he was just so, so scared. And one day, and probably lots of days, his mom brought him to the library and dropped him off and showed him where the books about bugs were. And he spent days and days and days reading every book about bugs that he could find. Once he learned about them, then he wasn't scared anymore. And I thought that was just really interesting. It doesn't mean that you won't be frightened of something after you learn about it, but that's one of the things that we need to spend so much more time about is learning and asking questions and finding out what is it that I need to know. And at the end of his talk, he said, after all of that, and I grew up and I went to school, I became an entomologist. And that's a scientist who studies bugs. So he didn't stop learning. And he said at the end, don't be scared. If you're different, if you think different, just don't be scared. And I was reading, kind of put this together and kind of make a, a, a little pathway. I was reading that Bible story about James and John and Simon and Andrew and Jesus coming and saying, hey guys, let's go, drop your nets, stop fishing. You don't live here anymore. We're gonna go on these trips and we're gonna talk to people and we're gonna learn some more things. And can you imagine, I just wonder, what did those men look like with their faces? Like, huh? What? Maybe they ask questions like, are you kidding me? I can't leave here. But you know what they did? They stopped. They told the people that worked with them, please take care of my fishing boat. Keep fishing. We've got a job to do. And I'll bet you, just kind of wondering that same thing. I wonder if they were scared. I wonder if they said, this is way different than fishing. I know fishing, but I don't know where I'm going. But they said, oh, I'm going to trust this guy who says, come on, let's go. And they learned about it. And they became our disciples that we talk about now. And we continue to learn about. So don't be afraid to be different. Don't be afraid to learn. Just be calm and trust that you're going to learn something. And you're going to be in a different place. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for making each one of us different. There's some things that are the same about each other, things you like, where you grew up, what you look like, but also there's differences, the way that you think, the way that you want to do things. So make sure that you say, wow, so glad I have those things that are different. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together.
We begin today with a prayer from our global ministries partners in Lebanon. We come before you, our God and creator, with hearts that are bewildered by the struggles and difficulties that continue to overwhelm and pressure us physically, emotionally, economically, and spiritually. With the start of the new year and in the season of Epiphany, we find it difficult to see new hope, and new beginnings, or see changes for the better in the lives of the people of Lebanon, or even throughout the world. Yet we find comfort in knowing that your love for us does not change. Give us to op guide us to open our hearts to you, to open our ears to hear your voice, as you invite us to hear your clear call to follow you. Make us eager to accept your invitation to repent and believe your good news. Only in you can we find rest. Our hope comes from you alone. Guide us to trust you in all circumstances. Only through you, complete trust, will, will we find refuge and be certain of your unchanging love for all and be willing to share that with the world. God, to these prayers from Lebanon, we add our own. We thank you that the inauguration day was a day of peace, and we pray for the new leaders of our nation as they work toward a better future for our citizens and our world. We grieve with the family of Hank Aaron, even as we give thanks for the inspiration he has been to so many throughout his career and his life. His talent could only be eclipsed by his courage and his integrity, and we are grateful to all who have been able to, to learn from the example he set both on and off the field. We give thanks for Central Christian Church and Seekers Harbor, both of Billings, Montana. We pray for their pastors, Doug Garner and Becky Taylor, for their ministries and for their congregations as they continue to worship online during COVID times and as they seek to be the church in these challenging days. We ask for blessings of courage and hope for the vulnerable and excluded in our community and those who work to protect them and meet their needs, such as the, those who are camping downtown near City Hall, the Opportunity Council, the severe weather shelters and Lighthouse Mission. We ask you to be with Marilyn as she struggles with pain and health issues and for Chris Ann's uncle-in-law as he struggles with COVID. May they find comfort and strength for their days. And we echo Sandy's prayers for our country and ask you to guide us into making this a true land of peace for all people, a place in which the prosperity of the few might become the enough for all. 
All this we pray in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture is from Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 14 from the Inclusive Bible. After the arrest of John the baptizer, Jesus appeared in Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The reign of God is at hand. Change your hearts and minds and believe this good news. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw the brothers Simon and Andrew casting their nets into the sea, since they fished by trade. Jesus said to them, follow me. I will make you fishers of humankind. They immediately abandoned their nets and followed Jesus. Proceeding a little further along, Jesus saw the brothers James and John Barzebedee they too were in their boat, putting their nets in order. Immediately Jesus called them, and they left their father Zebedee standing in the boat with the hired help, and went off in the company of Jesus. May holy wisdom enter through our ears. May she find a home in, in our hearts. One of the characteristics of Mark's gospel is that he wants to get to the point. He doesn't spend a lot of extra words when a few will do the trick. For instance, uh, you know the story of Jesus being led into the wilderness where he fasted for 40 days and Satan came and gave him three temptations including turning a stone into bread, going up onto a high place to view all the world, which could be his to rule, and finally going up at the pinnacle of the temple and saying, throw yourself off, and the angels can catch you. And at each stage in the temptation story, Jesus had some very poignant answers for Satan. Well, in Mark, that whole story is told in two verses. Ready for this? And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. The end. I added the end just for flair. But that was Mark's style. It was almost like he had somewhere else he needed to be. He didn't want to dilly-dally along the path of telling the world about Jesus. So... In those seven verses that Bruce just read, we get the arrest of John the Baptist, Jesus coming to Galilee to preach a message of hope, the calling of two different sets of disciples, one a set of brothers who abandon their astonished father, Zebedee, who's literally left behind, standing in the boat. Yet... If we unpack this tiny package in Mark, we discover they're one of Jesus's main themes. In just one verse, Mark lets us know one of the most important messages from Jesus. The kingdom of God is near. Now, in other places, Jesus expands on that to say that the kingdom of God is within you. It's, it's already in you. We just have to figure out a way to wake it up. 
and let it blossom. But Mark is off and running, and so is Jesus. We can, we can attempt to speculate about why Jesus called these particular people, or we can argue about the seeming fact that he called only men as disciples, because actually there's plenty of evidence that there were women disciples as well. Or we can try to extrapolate from the gospel story and ask, why does Jesus call each of us? And what does that mean? And, and when we do follow Jesus, what does he teach his followers? In this case, they were simply fishermen. So, so what is he calling them to become? Well, in reality, Jesus doesn't call them to be anything other than who they are. He doesn't call them to be rabbis like him. He doesn't even call them into a career in carpentry, though I'm sure he had much to teach. He calls these fishermen to remain fishermen, but to become fishermen who fish for something a little deeper than what they're accustomed to. Jesus calls them to live into the depths of their own lives, not to try to live out Jesus's life, because they remain at heart fishermen who will develop a heart for Jesus and for the humanity that Jesus serves. This is not a new call to a new career to be a professional Christian. It's a call to experience a deeper awareness of that presence and the kingdom of God. To be aware of what God has already given us. And then use it to love God and to love our neighbors. This is a call to enter the way of God. To become a partner in the working of God in this world. Now that begs the question, what do we really believe about the way God works in each of us? The way God works in our church in this world? Have we kind of grown stuck in our expectations about what God is up to? Do we have eyes that are able to see the surprising ways in which God moves in the midst of situations whose outcome we think we already know? Is there something new, something beyond what we can see, beyond what we know, beyond our familiar limits? These disciples left their boats, their families, their bewildered father. What are we willing to leave behind in order to truly follow Jesus? Well, maybe we're not supposed to leave anything behind, but instead find something new within us. What if we have had this something new all along, something that can transform our lives, transform our community, transform our world? Earlier this week during the inauguration, Many of us were transfixed by the words of a poem from a young woman named Amanda Gorman. Now in the poem, she describes herself as a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother. She concluded her beautiful poem with a challenge to the nation, a challenge to each of us. She said, we will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. And every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country, our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge, battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light if we're only brave enough to be it, brave enough to see it. Her words remind us that uh, just like Jesus calling the disciples, she's reminding us that who we already are, the gifts we already possess are enough. You've been fishing? Well, keep on fishing. You've been teaching? Well, keep on teaching. You've been working in the fields? Well, keep on working in the fields. Only now you'll use those gifts to help bring about the kingdom of God, that beloved community 
a world where love is king, a world where there is enough light to bring hope to the darkness. You may remember the story of the house with the golden windows. It truly is a beautiful story with a profound lesson to teach. Once, there were two mountaintops, one to the east, the other to the west. And on each peak was a house. Early one morning before sunup, a young child walked out of the house on the eastern peak to gather berries to have with breakfast. She walked back to the house just as the sun peaked over the horizon, sending warm rays of light across the mountaintops and over to the house on the western peak. As she watched, that house lit up with golden windows. And so from that day on, this young one would get up before sunrise and sit and look at the house on the western peak. And when the sun would come to the day, the house would light up with golden windows. And so this young one decided that the first place she would visit when she went to seek her fortune would be to go to the house with the golden windows. And when that time came, she was up early. When the sun came to the day, its warm rays lit the house with the golden windows and she started on her way. By noon, she had reached the valley floor where she cooled her feet in the creek. After a small lunch and a short rest, she continued her journey up the other side. That took her all afternoon, and it was early evening when she came into the yard. The family of the house came out to meet her. They welcomed her and gave her a drink of water and asked, where do you come from? Oh, she said, I came from the house on the eastern peak. Their eyes grew wide with excitement. You mean you live in the house with the golden windows? And she turned and she looked at her house on the eastern peak. And as she watched, the rays of the setting sun lit up her house with golden windows. Jesus reminds us that we already have the light. We already have the love. We already have the spirit. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Week of Changes. We started this week celebrating the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. One of his most famous quotes may be seen many times over. The arc of moral justice is long, but bends towards justice. In these dark times we have just experienced, this quote should give us hope and optimism. There are better days ahead for our nation. But we must remember Dr. King and his fellow freedom writers knew that the moral art does not bend on its own. It's on all of us to work towards justice and progress. Each and every one of us can be of service to our community and nation. We must recommit to never being silent in face of the injustice we see around us. Truth has no secrets. Working with the creator, creative power that is within us means Learning how to focus our attention is something we have to work with. If we're going to do to be good at change, we have to put some effort into it and make that change happen. Let us pray. Creator God, walk with us as we seek to draw and expand our table, welcoming back those whom we share common bonds, be that friends and family. Guide us in our reaching out to forgive and reconcile our differences. Let us welcome all to our virtual table we have set before us today. Amen. Please partake of the emblems 
you have set before you. Let us receive our benediction. God, you have breathed into us the wind of your spirit. You have created us to hold within us a bit of holiness. You have called us to let that spark of divinity shine bright in this world. Forgive us, God, when we have kept it under a bushel basket. And give us the courage to set it on top of the lampstand in order to give light and love to a world that is so eager for a new day to dawn. This is our hope. And this is our prayer. Amen.